using my voice is moving around to preserve what he was doing. C-SPAN, he is. Thank you very much. It would be on YouTube. So. No, I don't think the uh, contract I signed to give a lot of them for it on YouTube. That doesn't mean it won't happen. That doesn't mean it won't happen. I'm really surprised at 1 o'clock on a Saturday afternoon in Baltimore on a beautiful day there are all of you people sitting here. Does that say something about uh, your planning before you came? Anyway, I thought we'd take a little chance just to introduce ourselves. Um, my name is Gordon Russell. I'm the Associate Dean for Library and Information Technology at Charleston School of Law. I laughingly tell people that I have actually been on sort of tour America for the last 16 years. Um, I'm a Canadian who uh, decided after four winters at the University of Manitoba that I had enough of winter weather and uh, was luckily enough to send an application, job application to the University of Miami and thankfully the associate dean at the time didn't remember me sitting on a bus with him from Sacramento to Reno. And, all of you who were old timers may remember the Reno conference. They did a pre-conference, and he sat beside me and he said, "I understand you're thinking about coming to the U.S. Would you like to talk to me about going to the University of Miami?" My answer to him: Who in their right mind would go to the University of Miami? <laughs> Eight months later, in the middle of the winter time in Winnipeg, Manitoba, I'm sitting looking at a map. <laughs> the couple little geography lessons I'll give you if you're not aware of: It is actually 1,500 miles from Toronto, Canada, to Winnipeg, Canada. It is 1,500 miles from Toronto, actually less than 1,500 miles from Toronto to Miami. And at the time, my father was the executive producer for the Blue Jays, so he spent two and a half months in Dunedin, Florida. Yeah, all the family would go visit him. Nobody came to visit us in Winnipeg for some strange <laughs> reason. <laughs> and I look at them and say, why wouldn't I live in Miami? As I looked and saw that they had posted the same job that I had so blithely said I wasn't interested in. So I sent a resume. Thankfully, some of you may remember Warren Rosemary. Warren met me at the airport. At that point, he remembered who I was, but was kind enough not to tell me to go back immediately and actually interviewed me for the job and uh, hired me. So we moved to Miami and uh, since then have sort of been, as I said, circling the US. We went to New Mexico, to Massachusetts, back to Miami, and now are in Charleston. So, I am sort of the tourist of the United States and have enjoyed the opportunity to see a lot of great parts of the country. And uh, that, but probably the one thing that strikes most people who know me is I tend to be on the forefront at least of digital libraries and pushing that sort of piece of it. So that's a little bit about me. And Keith, you want to take a minute and introduce yourself? Sure. I'm uh, Keith Berthrong. I'm the uh, electronic services librarian at uh, Drexel. University Earl Mag School of Law Library. We just got renamed about three weeks to a month ago, so I'm still getting used to saying that. And um, there's not too much, uh, not too much to say. This is my uh, my first conference presentation, so bear with me. I'll be hiding behind the podium. And um, that's about all. Yeah. But, uh, Great. And I told him I'd save him a little time, but it's mostly in order to give me the, the form. It's a little hard for me to stop taking the time I have, so you have uh, that to bear with. I always have to have some quote for you, but I'll say it's not the strongest to survive, not the most intelligent, but the ones most responsive to change. So I think I've adapted and changed over the last 15 years and I'm still around. Which leads me to a question. What do you want from a faculty web page? Okay. That was the question I asked myself. What did I want? Well, the first thing I wanted was very little to do with it. <laughs> that would be helpful. So that led to a couple of things that are important to me. One of the things as we set up the law school at Charleston four and a half years ago was trying to think about what we were about. I had the enviable or unenviable opportunity to basically build an IT department and build a library. Okay. First thing I knew for sure was that I don't think that IT is what law schools are about. <coughs> I'm not offending IT people around here. It just happens to be the tool that we use. And clearly, for me, that tool meant, how do I get those things out of the law school? How do I get them somewhere hosted as a solution 
that is 24-7 access. I'm starting from law school, I got myself and one other librarian, I have no IT department, and the last thing is, I don't want phone calls at 3 o'clock in the morning saying something isn't working. So we looked at web hosted solutions. Email, we found a company. I kid you not, we found a company up in New York who happened to do email for the federal magistrate judges. And it just happened that one of our founders was a federal magistrate judge. So they thought that giving to us free would somehow enhance their relationship with the federal magistrate judges. So they, this company up there, basically for almost nothing, hosted our student email accounts. 24-7 on their servers, that was great. As long as it was up, I didn't have, and I had a 24-hour seven phone number for him. So if it went down, I knew who to phone. And he actually answered, which was even more surprising. I'm sure it wasn't anything about Charleston School of Law, it was the fact of the federal magistrate judge, right? But it worked. So email was out there, web-hosted solution. In the interim, and that's worked for us for four years. This summer, we're just in the process of actually, amazingly, we now have an EDU address. It's amazing what happens when you get ABA accreditation when you're a standalone school. Even after you talk to the Department of Education, it says provisional accreditation doesn't mean that you're accredited. And we had to fight with them for six months. But we are actually at EDU now. And so if it hasn't happened, sometime in the next week, we'll actually move our email to Google. Okay. Again, I was looking for a web hosted solution out there. The only reason we made the move was I wanted to have some other benefits that Google gave me. One of them is I wanted to do instant messaging from a reference desk. So we were able to create an infra reference. We only have that group of people, so it's just us. So it's a web hosted solution that allows me to do email. Our integrated library system is a web hosted solution. We use a company called EOS. Some of you may remember EOS in an earlier permutation when they were data track. EOS is just they happen to have come out with a web hosted, web based product that they hosted on their own servers at their own place of operation 24 7, did all their updates, all their upgrades for us. And they were even so nice. When you're dumping in the 200, 300,000 records, electronic records, and you got to load them, it's nice to have a company that thinks helping to do that is a good thing. So we're currently sitting, sometime this summer, we'll have about 600,000 records in our catalog that link to electronic. Most of that, the biggest load that we just did is 300,000 Lexus CIS records into our catalog. We actually split our catalog and have just a government documents piece. But again, 24-7 supported outside of us. Administrative package, we're a small school, we had to find a product. There are a lot of things you do when you start a startup school as a librarian you don't think you're gonna have anything to do with. <laughs> you know, I've been hours and hours talking about phone systems. I know more about IP than I ever wanted to in phones. But the biggest problem was administrative package. Because all of you probably are players with some of the main players out there from your universities of that. We talked to Datatel, we went with Datatel. They were willing to let us piggyback on the University, the College of Charleston. So we had some relationships with them. So said, no problem, we'll even set the lines up, you can piggyback off them. It only cost you $500,000. <laughs> you know, we talked to every other product out there we talked to, horrendously expensive. So where do we end up with? Found a little company called RJM up in Pennsylvania. They, they do little small schools, right? For us, they get a school that, you know, 600 students are what we are. We need, I needed students, what do my students need? They need to get online, register, look at their courses, those types of things, does all those pieces. And in all honesty, it cost me about 20,000 a year. Okay, so it was there. So that led me to where I needed the next piece. How do I find a solution for getting my faculty's information out there I'm going to call him. I don't think that was it. But, so, again, given my bias, I was looking for a solution that I didn't have to deal with, that was web hosted solution, and we started talking to VPress, okay, who were really nice to us because they said, you know, we can do a lot of things for you. We can come up with a template for you, a look and feel. You give us the pictures. In fact, I kept getting calls from them that were sort of like, um, well, how can he help you? And when I, when I said, well, we got myself and another professor, we'll give it a try, we got it set up, then it was like, how do you, what's with the rest of you guys? How can we help the rest of you get them up and get it going? But what we were looking for was <coughs> something that gave us 
our color, our feel. So this was the look that we came up with. It's just one of those looks. It's not the only look you can have out there. Here's an example of another look. One of the things that's highlighted here, you'll notice on their particular page at Chicago Kent, they actually still link to a faculty biography. So if you have a web page with your own biographies that you put up, you can still link back to that if you want to do that. We, in the instance, were trying to get rid of that double layer and go to a, a solution that would put it up. The other thing they promised us was that if you actually did a search for me on Google, that I would come up. Now, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, you can ask yourself, but the press becomes a link piece, so if anybody's looking for you or any of my faculty, it leads them into the D press to their informational page. So you want to think about options for faculty page design, structurally, what does it do? I mean, we showed you my look. These are some examples of other looks that could be out there from the press. So you can do a lot of different looks working with them on how it comes out, what it looks like with a template piece is that you want to work with. So we just have to be pretty blase and bland compared to some of these others, as you can see. But it does for us what we want it to do. Okay. Simply put, you have an author's home page. You can put in the information. You can browse by subject or article type so you can define what your types are, how you arrange your articles, um, material sort of pieces, and put them up. Series Home actually takes you to the whole list of all of your professors or group that you have within your institution on it. So it gives you some options. What was important for me was how we're going to add and update the pages, right? I'm, I'm truly an optimist. You know. My theory is, gee, this is great, right? Because theoretically, <coughs> I'm assuming that anybody can get into their account and edit it. it. Means I can go into my account and edit it. So I can create, add information. My goal was to, in a sense, be able to structure this to throw it out to my faculty. Same way. So once I go into my edited page, you can see I can edit the introduction piece about me. I can add, categorize my own writings, how I want to organize those pieces. I can upload content. What I've actually found most interesting is I upload a lot of my PowerPoint presentations that I give at conferences and that. And I'll come back to that in a minute because you can put together those pieces. So how that information you put there affects what you see over here and links it together. So you have that opportunity. And my editor is a feature that says, gee, I can have other people edit this information. So I can decide who I'm going to let edit my page. Okay? You'll notice that I actually have somebody who can edit my page. Awesome job. Allison probably doesn't quite know why she's the editor of my page, but what she has become is an editor of a lot of other pages, and we'll talk about that. Who should have editorial rights? And why would you want to have editorial rights? Okay. My goal was to come up with a solution that faculty could do it, right? So theoretically, what should happen in this, this design was we sent the B Press basically our faculty names, pictures of our faculty, and they gave a basic page for each of our faculty. It was created, and they could then log into it. Okay, so they have basically a skin that they could produce the information that we just saw, add in information. So they could self-publish their information. What did they want to tell about themselves? what content they wanted to put up. Now, in my ideal world, that would have been it, right? I'm done. Library's done its job. You're sitting there. Put it up. Interestingly enough, I kept getting calls from Kathleen from B Press saying, you got all these pages, but nobody was doing anything with them. Can we help you? What's the problem? <laughs> and so I kept saying to my faculty, what are you going to do with some stuff up there? We went through demos. We showed them how to do it. Nothing happened. So at some point, I thought maybe the next step would be saying, Gee, the faculty might use their faculty assistants to do this. Well, I thought that would be a great use of faculty assistants' time. Right? They're working with the professor. They're dealing with all their stuff that they're doing, sending out articles, working on articles. I think they'd be the perfect people to put up the information. For some reason, I still haven't understood, they didn't think it was part of their job description. So I told HR, from now on, we have to have a new job description for faculty assistants. The press, since other duties is assigned, didn't work. So where did we end up going? 
not where I would have liked to, but what we've ended up doing is actually thinking about who had from within the library the contact point with our faculty. Well, actually for us it was our faculty liaison people. They were building it for. And we actually probably had a little bit different relationship with our faculty. A, because it was nice and small. B, they'd all been hired after me, so I was a senior faculty member. <laughs> That's an interesting dynamic. And the other thing was, we're under constant ABA inspection. And when the ABA comes in, what do they want to see? All the publications of our faculty. So our faculty are in a habit of having to give them to somebody, and for some reason, could the dean decide had to have all the faculty publications for the faculty? The library. And had to store them, keep them. So we already had a lot of material, and we were getting anything that was new. So it made sense. So we sort of went from that process into the process of this, gave editorial rights to the faculty liaison. So, and actually, we actually cheated a little, and Allison Jones is one of our librarians, took on the initial project since she was responsible for collecting all the faculty publications process and worked with them. Now, I will be honest, I had two or three of my faculty who basically did it themselves. They were excited about it, put the information up. One of my faculty members, everything he does, he puts up probably before he goes and gives it or presents it, it's up there. In fact, if I went to his page, if I was online, Professor Beckman, he's turned it into an ad council. I mean, he's doing some nifty things. Uh, he's got three or four books out. One of them is a, uh, and he's doing a new thing with Nita, where he's actually doing charts for evidence, evidentiary charts that are being released by Nita. So he's got it up there. He's got a sample of a chart that can't be downloaded, a big sample across it, and then he has a nice link out to Nita where they can purchase it. So um, he's turned it into an advertising uh, <laughs> world extraordinaire. And he actually gets a lot of hits, amazingly, on a lot of his things. Uh, but it's interesting. Fairly simple sort of process from within the, the setup. This is just a, a menu-driven sort of piece that the upload. You can see it has a drop-down, so you can decide what it is that you're uploading into it, link it in. You can add your author. If you're a co-author, you can add a co-author to it. You add in the title information, publication, just a, a straight format process of just filling in uh, the tables and putting it up and uploading it in. So there's not a lot of work involved. That's why I thought our faculty could actually handle this from that sort of standpoint. The other piece that I find interesting is within it you have a mailing. You'll notice that in my case, there are actually this idea of subscribers is people who go to your page can become subscribers. So if they like what they see and they want to see what new is being added, they do that. So anybody who goes on Google comes to that, finds my page and says, oh, they're putting up stuff I'm interested in. They become a subscriber and anything that is added, they get a notification that something's been added to your page. So, a great way for that sort of process. And I haven't done this, but theoretically, you can actually send a mail message to all your subscribers. I don't know who the subscribers are, but I can send a mail message <laughs> to them. Does the faculty member know who the subscribers are? So if the students are brown nosing. Yeah. yeah. You can uh, launch it and organize it, take them off, put them off. Yeah. So you've got some control. But, you, but it is interesting, the people you do find out who are attending. But again, a faculty like that, right? Good mark their view. Yeah, use subscribers and just click go and it pulls up. But, you know. But they email addresses, right? Right. Uh, so you couldn't necessarily tell. Right. Well, you tell the end address, right? So if it was like your school that they were giving. Yeah, if they gave you your EDU or something. Like that, you'd have some. So you're not going to identify. But, you know, it is sort of competitive. You know, our faculty are talking about how many subscribers they have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Adding, adding them themselves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I like it really close. And as I said, you can compose a message or send something to your subscribers if you want to. So it is an interesting. The other piece that's nice is you can generate a report. And so what the report does is actually generates, tells you how many people have downloaded anything that's on your site. So I have that opportunity to look at anything that's up there and download how many times it's been downloaded. So. Um, well, I was just actually talking to Kathleen today and saying, because what happens is every month or so I get an email from the press telling me how many downloads on, on the various sites. I could go in here and look myself, but I don't bother. But getting the email is kind of nice. And so each of your faculty members gets an email 
each month telling about download. I was telling her it would actually be helpful if she'd send me an email with everybody's download. Right? Then I would actually be able to go to that and say, see, all that work you put in has been worth it because you're getting all these hits. Or I thought maybe we could turn it into a competition. Maybe I could have an award from the library. Most downloads a month. iPods. <laughs> iPods. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. It, it is an interesting idea. But, but again, you want to generate some buzz, and there are ways here that you can put some of that buzz piece into it in that sort of process. So um, the other piece of it from a standpoint of this whole world of selected works is that you can actually do a search of everything that is in selected works um, by all people who are putting things in selected works. So all schools that are using selected works and have material there, you can actually search that whole universe of material. So it does give you an opportunity to search. And it does have a list of the institutions and departments. Uh, I think this is also probably also searching the repository piece or just the... Um, it's just searching the selected works pages this, from this page. From this page. Yeah. And so you have this opportunity so, uh, of building. So from my stand, standpoint, the more of you that do it, the better my searching as a spot is. So it's uh, an, an opportunity to put that. Advanced search actually allows you where you can search by some fields, last names, or, or includes full text. So it's actually searching those pieces that you put up. So if I upload a Word document or a PDF, it's searching that full document for me. So I can do some fun things with that. Uh, my students like it because it means they can search anything that across our school to see what the faculty may have written on a subject uh, that they're taking. Seems to be an interest to them as a sort of process. And uh, any questions of me? Uh, what kind of cost was involved in your point? Kathleen, you want to talk about cost? Yeah. Um, so the annual license for selected works for a department or a law school is 5000 a year. Um, and that includes uh, pages for the faculty and an aggregation page. Um, it also includes B-Press support time, and um, B-Press also builds all the initial pages um, for the school and then kind of hands it off and trains. And that's very good to build a number of faculty. Yeah, we, we, we build you don't the shell. Put, yeah, you don't put in the article. Yeah, usually we'll put in a picture and we might go to, if you have an existing page, we might link up to your page. Um, is there, you, by, sort of by default, you set up uh, each faculty to have edit privileges for their page. Uh, is there a way to not give them edit privileges to their own page? Um, that's an interesting question, and we've actually had that asked of us before, mm -hmm. and um, we've released um, new versions of the software every couple of months and one thing that's on the docket is to allow some institutions that want it the ability to turn off editing for their offers. We're, we're actually implementing selected works here at the University of Maryland and we're not asking the faculty to do it themselves. Our faculty don't do anything themselves. They do that by themselves. Well, they do that themselves. You know, even the queen has to do that herself. I, mean, I grew up in Canada, and I used to sing. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, but that was the day so, we used to have to sing God Save the Queen, too. So uh, we, we contacted them and say, we're going to do this now. Would you like us to build one? And you and I have got a couple of pages. So I think we're doing our fifth one at the moment. And I show them, and then they say yes. and say, OK, you know, we've already got all of their works in our digital commons, so we're just shoving them over and then letting them have a look, but they don't have any edit rights to it at all. Um, one of the things I still get asked to do, no matter how much everything is online, is can I still make a printed list? So is it possible to generate a big list of every publication for every faculty member and print it out? Um, yeah, so on um, each selected work page, there's a print page button that kind of formats it. For could really I like, go through and do it all? You know, could you format it neatly so it would make a nice little booklet that could be printed up? Well, you'd have to put the pages together. Like each page, each mm -hmm. page would print nicely, um, but there's not one button where like you could. But you could all probably that. export them all into something and clean yeah. out or something. Yeah, like that. yeah. You could actually, um, I mean, you could export all of the data from from your page in various formats. Um, but in terms of a nice, you know, print page, that would be each select works page you have to print up. Right. Uh, is there a, uh, what you're doing? Now, the 5K, is that for 
a certain number of licenses? Or so that's um, up to 100 sites. Up to 100 sites. Okay, any more questions for now? Okay, well, uh, I, was, I was asked to talk on sort of the, uh, the actual you know, in the trenches, on the ground uh, implementation of selected works because uh, my institution I basically uh, had, to, had to do it all myself. So, uh, so uh, just to give you uh, just to give you a little perspective, uh, uh, Drexel Drexel Burnham School of Law is a, is a new law school. We, uh, our first class was in fall of 2006. Uh, I came January of 2007, and let's see, our library opened in March of 2007, and uh, we just got our provisional accreditation uh, in March of this year, I believe it was. So. 18 months, and uh, when we, uh, uh, it was very early on before the library was even, was, uh, even done being built that we decided we wanted, uh, we wanted this faculty solution, and uh, I believe it was, uh, who was my library director initially came up with the idea and took it to the dean, and uh, we needed to sell it to the dean, so I created, uh, one, created one sample page for one of our faculty members, uh, took that to the dean, he liked the look of it, and he said, you know, go ahead, let's promote this. So the way we started doing it was uh, we wanted to do wanted to do an announcement and some training. So we created sites for uh, sort of three key faculty members who had a few publications. And uh, once once we created them, we sent out an announcement. Said this is selected works. This is how you know this is how it is. You can edit your own pages. We'll train you on it if you like. And uh, the you know and then we went for the faculty response and uh, <laughs> it was about the same as uh, Gordon got it sounded like. Uh, I did eventually talk to a few of the faculty, and I think I got maybe one of them to write me back. And uh, the, the general consensus was that they didn't have uh, electronic copies of their papers. And uh, I sort of found this amazing. Just you know, I tend to back up. I tend to back up things pretty well, but if it's anything I've been working on for more than a week, I back it up really well. That is not having that was kind of amazing to me. So the next thing we did was try to have a training and an introduction to hopefully drum up some support. And uh, it was attended by three faculty members, not the same ones whose pages we created. Uh, but luckily one of them was the dean of faculty. And uh, he really liked it and he said, okay, I'll push for this at the faculty meeting. You know, I'll tell them, you know, this is what we want to do. And the key thing is, it is to say this is, what the, this is what the dean of the school wants to do. You know, it's sort of like, you know, the mom said. <laughs> so. Uh, so there were uh, there were a few challenges. Uh, the main challenge, uh, which I've already gone into, is getting the papers themselves, gathering yeah, the faculty papers. Uh, then, of course, there are the copyright issues. Uh, you know, with full text versus linking versus what we want to do, and right there, full text versus links. Uh, what's preferred, and then just the labor required to pull this all together. As far as the gathering faculty papers, like I said, not much response, not many electronic copies. Uh, so we started looking for other sources. Uh, just did you know, Google and Google Scholar searches for all the papers just to find them was freely available online. Found a few that way. Uh, found a few more through SSRN, and uh, then we, and then eventually we just got down to scanning print law reviews and reprints, uh, which brings up copyright issues, of course, when you're scanning these. And uh, I'm sure you're familiar with Sherpa Romeo. It's the uh, the site you could go to to check. Uh, you could look up by journal or by publisher and find uh, find publishers' uh, reprint rights. And the uh, thing is, uh, it's not very useful for law reviews. Uh, the rights aren't very well known. You know, it's student, you know, student run. There's two, that turnover every two years. So their policies aren't really well known. Um, one good solution to this uh, was, and I don't remember the name of the librarian who came up with this, but uh, it might very well be at this conference, was the Copyright Experiences Wiki, uh, which was a wiki where if you, if you dealt with a law review, you could go to the wiki page and say what your experience was with them and basically what policy they gave you. So that if a couple of years down the line, uh, you know, somebody else deals with the same law review and has a problem with them, and they give them a different answer, you can point at this and say, "Oh no, you did this for him." <laughs> and it's a really good idea, but it hasn't been updated in a while. It's you know, as as with it, as with any wiki, it's only going to be as good as uh, you know how many people are contributing to it. Uh, so in a sense, it was very hard to find the, you know the, the policies for the law reviews, and we weren't going to be going out to all of them and asking. So. We sort of did the, it's easier to ask for, uh, for forgiveness than to ask for permission. So, so when we, uh, it brings it to deciding between full text or links, and obviously full text is ideal. Uh, you know, we want this to uh, uh, disseminate these papers uh, as widely as possible, and any obstacles we can reduce in between that uh, is ideal. Uh, so full text was really what we were going for. Uh, 
If not, we could do, um, at, at the beginning, open URL wasn't implemented yet, uh, so we were uh, thinking of direct links to the resources, which would work fine if you're on campus or if you're already authenticated. If not, you'll just be getting error messages. And uh, so, and uh, since then, uh, uh, VPress implemented open URL support in it, and uh, it's, a, it's a better alternative, but it's, you know, that's also not perfect. And especially with, uh, with our law articles, uh, the the, the open URL targets that are coming up most often are Hein Online and Lexis Academic. And Hein Online, uh, as far as I know, doesn't support linking to the article level. If anyone's managed to do it, please let me know. But uh, Hein Online only link to the journal level, so you know you still have to follow the citation and actually track down the article. And uh, Lexis Academic seems to be confounded by long titles. If you give it anything longer than the point where it truncates the titles in its database, uh, it'll just return an error message and won't find it, even if it does happen. And uh, then there was the labor uh, required to make this all happen. Uh, you know, I, I initially put out the word to faculty about you know how they could edit their own pages. They were too busy creating the curriculum and all those things. You know, so they didn't really have time to work on that. Uh, so the Electronic Services Library, NV, uh, created all the faculty pages. Uh, and uh, what I would do is just create them all, and then once I was complete, send to the send it to the faculty member themselves and get you know comments, edits, anything like that. And didn't usually hear back. Um, as far as the uh, as far as the scanning of the print documents, um, like I said when we started this, the library wasn't done being built, and uh, even when it was built, we only had a third of our classes in. Uh, we only had our one L, so uh, they had a lot of free time, and uh, so we gave it to access services. They had student workers, and uh, so they gave it to them to kill a lot of time. Uh, so we created pages for uh, all the faculty members of the publications. There's a total of 16. Um, since we had a lot of uh, a lot of younger faculty members, there were some that just hadn't published yet. Uh, so we didn't actually create pages for them because we just didn't want to have a, you know, a blank, a blank page. As we all, and uh, the other thing I should mention is that we already had faculty pages on our website. Uh, the faculty pages would list a brief bio, CV, uh, usually, usually a list of published works, uh, but no, no kind of full text link or anything like that. And uh, so because the faculty info and CVs were already on the website, that made the collection real easy uh, to actually get the material into selected works. But I could see at a larger institution or something where your faculty pages already don't have that, how the collection of the CVs and all that could probably be as time consuming as the collection of the articles. Um, as far as the print documents uh, scanned, we, uh, we actually, the library had a faculty publications display that we just put in a light, you know, in a light box and uh, gathered fa faculty publications for that, which they were willing to give us their, their uh, print reprints, even if they didn't have the electronic copies. So I said, oh good, we have all these reprints, you know, let's, let's scan those and put those up, you know, since we can't get the electronic copies. Uh, so we ended up doing that. Um, if there were abstracts for, paper, uh, uh, for the papers uh, within the paper, we included them. Uh, if, not, we, if not, we just left, uh, left it well alone. Um, and then once, it, once, once they were all completed, we re-announced to faculty and you know, let them know individually they all had their site set up. As far as continuing maintenance, um, there were only a couple of faculty members who uh, personally maintained them, uh, pretty, pretty much the same as what you said at Charleston. And uh, for the most part, whenever a faculty member has a new papers uh, or edits on their page, they would just submit, submit it to me, ask me to change it, I'd do that and let them know. Um, but since uh, it's actually, uh, the, the thing that's really helped is we've uh, since created an SSRN paper series. And I mean, that was an issue with faculty at first, asking if this was you know, redundant with SSRN and not really wanting to duplicate effort. But uh, since we started the SSRN paper series, faculty have been very responsive to that. And, you know, giving us giving us their papers to submit, and now, and now they're aware of it. And they're saying, you know, oh, here's my paper. Submit this to SRN and selected works. And they sometimes ask us to submit it to places we don't actually subscribe to. Uh, <laughs> but uh, since we've done the paper series, it's also been good because we've really formalized the process, and uh, we've created a submission process where they ask us for a paper. And we send, you know, we send them back a sheet saying, okay, well, if you can give us an abstract and some suggested keywords and things like that, that would be great. As soon as we have that information, that can go into VPress as well. And let's see. Uh, as far as the actual uh, use of the software, uh, I found it real easy to use. Uh, like I said, I've been using it for a while. You know, if, you know, if ever there were any, you know, bugs or you know, enhancement requests, uh, you know, contacted Kathleen, and uh, VPress was really good at handling them. There were <coughs> a lot of specific things that were, you know, that I remember suggesting that have uh, since been implemented. Um, adding the pages, it was uh, really quick to do. Uh, the most con the time consuming tasks were if you had large PDFs that you had to upload. That's you know, kind of unavoidable. Uh, and then once, once your uploads are there, you have to wait for the page updates, which are anywhere between 30 seconds and a couple minutes to take place. 
But uh, it's, you know, it's a good thing to do if you have you know another task you're working on, you know, and all tab away. But I'd say it probably took uh, to create all the packets, pages, all things combined, maybe two full work days or two and a half or so. Uh, and the reaction from faculty has uh, been largely positive. Uh, they're very aware of the site. Um, like I said, when they submit papers to us now, they say, you know, put put this on you know my faculty page as well, uh, as well. you know, put it on the B Press page. Um, and like I said, not many are, not many are interested in maintaining the sites themselves, but they're happy it's there. And uh, the one professor who was actually most excited about it who talked to me actually just loved having all of his papers in one spot. And uh, what he said he would just go to his publications page rather than look through his hard drive or look through his email or anything like that to track them down. And uh, that's about it. So, are there any questions? Yes. Uh, do you reformat the citation form they use? Uh, some, uh, I've done that in some of the sites. I haven't actually gone through and uh, and done it entirely to get into the blue book. Mm -hmm. But uh, but but it, but it is an option. You can you yeah, can because it doesn't do it doesn't automatically kind of format it. Blue book right, right, right. Like, unless they've updated it. That. So no, no, I, yeah, I don't believe it's automatic, but they give you the ability to customize the site. Yeah, you can customize it. And yeah. at our school at Akron, they wanted it to look at Blue Book, so we had to go through and italicize or large and small cap and all that stuff, which probably doesn't mean a lot, but they wanted to make sure it looked just like Blue Book. Right, right. But the other ones will want to look like all of it. <laughs> no, not our research story. <laughs> Yeah, that is one of the frustrations if you're, if you're looking for a, a, a citation format that you could take from and it's not. Um, yeah. We didn't do that. We just said. The users can figure it yeah. out if it's written reasonably. Well, no, most of our, if our students are just copying it, they won't figure it out, but that's their problem. Right? I had a question? Yeah. Did, did you try to go to directly to any of the law reviews to get electronic copies? Since they're the ones that generally had the last version, uh, I didn't just uh, just because it was it, too much. Too, too much, much for yeah. It was you know creating all these pages simultaneously. I mean, like now now that we're in the sort of maintenance period, and that's a it's a case by case. It would be a little easier, but also now that we're in the maintenance period, the faculty are sending us their preprints, which we have no issues with. Right, so, so now are the pay, are the stuff you have linked up there? Are they the final versions that are published, or are they earlier drafts? Do they make change? In other words. You know, most of these are going to go through several different edits mm -hmm. and during the publication process. And do you update for each of those edits, or is it a? Uh, if, I mean, if we're if we're made aware of the edits, uh, you know, or if if we get a newer version, um, like I said, most of, most of these came out of out of reprints of uh, of the law review articles, so most of them are the final versions. Um, but yeah, otherwise, with some of the uh, you know some of the the preprint submissions, there there is a chance that they want to do the uh, most current version. So I'll tell you, yeah. Do they have to think about that? Can yes. you upload um, different file formats? Yeah, you can actually, um, the, all the formats come through as PDF. You can actually upload uh, Word files, rich text files, and it automatically converts into PDF. Can you make it not automatically convert to um, PDF? Yeah, anything that's not Word or RTF, like PowerPoints, for example, it won't convert. But can you force it not to? I've had, um, getting reprint permissions, I've had at least one um, journal site. You can put it up, but not as P PDF. So. Um, bizarre, but that's what they told me. You know, <laughs> you, you could send an email to us. I do, I'm and, we would not, and we could not convert some of them, but no, the author can't right now, you know, check, convert this, don't convert this. The system automatically converts words. Once. What's that? It only came up once, uh, but... Uh, right. yeah. I will say one of the nice things about the, uh, it, it, does, it converts them into searchable PDFs. And uh, you actually have the option to uh, to search to either search by individual faculty member or to search uh, your entire institution, and uh, and those searches are full text searches through the uh, through the document. So that that can actually be pretty handy. Yes. I was just wondering, and this may be more of a question for Kathleen, but you had briefly mentioned um, your conversations with faculty about SSR, and our faculty one of the biggest pushbacks we're getting is, you know, oh my God, if I put my paper somewhere else, my SSR rank counts. Is going to go down, and they're, they're really focused on that number. How many times has my paper been accessed there? Was that an issue? Have you experienced that kind of at all? And, and is there anything that we can say to them? Right. Did someone else? Um, 
Yeah. Well, you got to count yeah. too. You add them together. It, it's interesting, and I've definitely encountered that. Um, it's interesting that I've encountered it before people have implemented selected works, and not encountered it after they've implemented. Um, so, in other words, I have heard no buzz that it's affected SSRN counts. Um, what I have heard is that you know you get distinctly different counts. You know, you keep your SSRN count, you get from a new audience by press. Um, the other thing you can do is um, you can always link, I mean if, if someone's adamant or really frightened for that, they can always link out to SSRN rather than, you know, upload the, the PDF a second time. And was there a reference you were saying about there, there was a report every month about that download count? Yeah, they they get, um, each author gets a, an email each month that says, you know, this is how, how many times your paper has been downloaded. I don't know if you were at the presentation on Thursday that the um, University of Georgia did on um, Digital Commons, which is another new press product, and they showed that the difference between SSRN downloads and the downloads from ePress, now they were talking about Digital Commons, but I think it would be fairly similar, was very interesting. They took the same paper, uh, uploaded to both SSRN and the Commons on the same day, and they showed that the uh, SSRN paper got a large number of hits right away, and then it sort of tapered off. It was very flat. Whereas the Commons posting continued to increase, and so that might be something you would want to do with your faculty. And I'm going to try that with ours and take a few papers and then check, and then demonstrate how you know they continue to rise and get more and more postings, whereas the other one flattens out. Yeah, one thing um, that we do at B Press that helps out our papers a lot is we full text index all of them in Google, um, which basically means that when someone goes to Google and, you know, let's say searches for a, an obscure literary term, um, it will search all of the PDFs. So it won't just search the metadata or the title of the paper, it's going to search all of your content in the paper. And uh, that seems to have a really huge effect on um, how our papers register in Google. And a couple of years ago at the ALS meeting, I think in D.C., uh, Dick Danner gave a report on uh, using SSRN and, and their own site and, and another site, and and his their study said that there were different audiences, mm -hmm. different people are familiar with going to different places. Yes, law faculty and maybe social scientists go to SSRN, but foreign law students or undergraduates may not go to SSRN. They might go to some other thing like Google. Aren't there about four or five uh, places that they track in uh, you know, Lexus and Westlaw? Yeah, that's just a marketing yeah. principle. Yeah, the more the merrier. Yeah. Yeah, and I think the answer your question, I think that if, if you can get counts, I, mean, I think that's the issue is they're more worried my counts because they're down I can't track it. But if, I, if you can say to them, you're going to get a track of this count, so you're just building up, because they're really only interested in total count, right? If they got more well, places that they can say. Sort of. There happens to be one of our faculty members who's very big blogging about, and, and what they're really concentrating on is SSR. Um, so in theory, the total count should placate them, but in, in yeah, and, and they're really worried about that. All I was doing is just linking all of the, you just be putting links to SSR, which would probably make your job on this point easier because you would not be putting up the documents. So you well, have your circulation list, students, and as well as professors' papers online. <laughs> Actually, give us a list of professors, we can have our circulation students do that. <laughs> I have more questions? Okay, well, thank you very much for sticking it out to the end of the conference. <laughs>